Hey there, got a different video for you today. This one, I'm gonna be answering your questions. And I often feel that I am just sitting here talking to a camera and I can't connect with you guys. And I do try to interact with you as much as possible through the comments and through DMs on Instagram and those sorts of things. And I also really love doing the live streams, but now that I'm doing Growers Live every other Tuesday night on the No-Till Growers channel, it's kind of like using up all my live streaming time, essentially. <laughs> so I like to get into more of a rhythm with doing that, but also I know a lot of you can't always attend those, and so I put out a call on Instagram and also on the community page on the YouTube channel and got a lot of questions. So I'm really excited to get, get to those, and it's been really cool because some of the questions I've answered in videos, but I have a lot of videos for you guys to check out, obviously, and you haven't seen them all, I know. So we'll get to those in a second. But before we get to that, I need to take a moment to talk about today's show sponsor, which is Growing for Market Magazine. Growing for Market's been in existence for 30 years, providing their publication to people all over the place. And their articles are fantastic. They're written by farmers and growers that have a ton of experience from lots of different situations. They have a print version and an online version. And I have to say, when I get the print version in the mail, I'm really excited to get it. It's a lot of fun. They also have an online archive of 1,600 articles for you to check out on all sorts of topics. If you're looking for more really good, detailed quality information, I really highly recommend that you check out Growing for Market. I also have a coupon code for 25% off, which is shovel. So links down below, please go check them out if you haven't already. And I really want to thank them for sponsoring this channel. Let's get on to answering your questions. We're going to get into the questions in just one second, but I just want to remind you that if you're looking for an answer for a specific topic, if you go to the, my YouTube page, there's a search box. If you can type in stuff in there, you'll probably find a video that has what you're looking for. I've done all over 200 videos at this point, but again, some of these questions, I, I don't know if I have answered or I, it's just in the mix and people, anyways, let's get to it. Uh, first question, are you gonna continue the farm tour videos? And the answer is absolutely yes. I've been super busy with all sorts of stuff. And the other part is that the season <clears throat> is now picking up and a lot of people, if you could probably realize that they don't want me coming to visit their farm in the winter time because farms don't look great in the winter time. So I will be doing that over the summer. I'm really excited about that. And it's usually, it's pretty much the, my favorite thing to do for the channel is filming other people, uh, sharing their farms, telling their stories, um, and showing you guys all the cool things that people are doing out there. So I will be doing that. And if you are, if there's some place near me, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, that you'd like me to go visit, just let me know. Uh, I really try to visit commercial farms and not homesteads and things like that. So uh, anyways, yes, I will be getting back to that real soon. Uh, next question, have you had any aphid problems? And if so, how do you deal with them? Uh, I've only had aphids a couple of times and I've really been, I guess, lucky that I haven't had them. The only time I've seen them was in a greenhouse or in a tunnel in the winter time. And I think a lot of that had to do with, you know, excess moisture and stuff like that. So for me, I don't really have aphids that often. Uh, those, that's the one sort of situation. And so I recommend just making sure that you are, you know, not letting your plants grow too close together and letting things you know have a lot of airflow and that those were my problems there so planting like lettuce for example too close together and the moisture would kind of get trapped in there and i don't know it was kind of a good home for them so again not over watering and then letting things vent has been uh, really helpful for me but i haven't had a huge problem with aphids um all right next question how do you deal with cutworms and squash and zucchini plants the worst enemy yes um cutworms can be horrible i haven't had to deal with that and this depends on if you are a small scale, like you're a gardener or if you're doing this on a larger scale. Uh, what I've heard is that you can take a cutting of either like a toilet paper roll or a paper towel roll and then just put those ring, like cut a little ring, put that uh, around the base of the plant uh, against the ground and then the cutworms can't get in there. So what they do is they come in, they wrap around and they just cut off the plant basically killing it so the other thing is they come out at night and so if you want to go try to hunt some at night I guess that's when you do it I haven't tried it though but uh, that's what I would probably recommend uh, there's probably things you can put on there to kill them I just don't know about them um, are you doing tomatoes this year no I'm not doing tomatoes this year and I have talked about this I think in the past but uh, in 2019 I had probably about 200 cherry tomato plants and I love growing tomatoes I love eating tomatoes the problem was the squirrels ate all of them and it was devastating. And I know I could like screen out my greenhouse or my tunnels and all that stuff. And as you guys probably know, I try to work with nature, not against it. So if something's just not working in my system, generally I just do something different. And it's kind of a bummer because I love growing tomatoes, but I just, I'm not growing tomatoes this year yeah, for that reason. It was funny though, after that whole thing happened, I found volunteer tomato plants all over my property because the, the, 
squirrels would like grab the tomatoes, eat part of it, drop it, and then tomato plants would come up. So yeah, no tomatoes this year, unfortunately. Uh, next question is why head lettuce over a mix like All Star? So if you guys don't know, All Star is a lettuce mix that Johnny sells. It's a mixture of a lot of baby leaves. And I've grown it before, I, I trialed it last year, and it's pretty cool. The thing is about direct seeded lettuce is that it won't germinate necessarily in the heat very well. Lettuce likes to germinate around 70 degrees or so. And so for me, I will germinate in my nursery. If it's too hot in there or too cold in there, I can bring it inside to just to germinate. So that's no problem. The other thing I noticed about the all-star mix in particular was that I didn't, I preferred the other lettuces that I was growing in terms of flavor, texture, all that kind of stuff. And the yields, the yield was not nearly as good as I was getting off of, you know, the Cherokee Mirabagenta mix, which I've been growing. And now the Salanova foundation mix is what I'm growing this season. And for me, it's all about yield in a small space. And so, because I don't have that many beds, I have to get the most out of each bed. And the biggest benefit about growing lettuce as transplants is they get three or four weeks in the transplant before they even go in the field. So in the time that they're growing in your nursery, you could have another crop in that bed. So you get a lot more yield versus direct seeding them. And so that's been the, uh, you know, the sort of decision for me. Also with like, you know, stuff like that, like the, the, the Salanova, you know, I'm getting probably 70, 80 pounds off of my 30 inch by 48 foot bed. So the yield is just massive. And I, I really can't complain about that. And I really like the product and the, uh, the chefs like it too. So uh, things like all-star mix are great. If you have an extra bed and you just have direct, you have seeds around, you can just seed it and then you can mix it in or you can beef up your mix on certain weeks that you're short. Uh, it does mix in with a lot of other things, but again, I just stick into that mix because of the yield and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how often do you add compost to your permanent raised beds? I made a video about how I flip my beds. I will leave a link down below for that video and any other videos I can think of that relate to the topics we talk about today. Every time I flip a bed, I add five five gallon buckets of compost and, and amendments. So every single time I flip a bed, I add a little bit of compost. Uh, next question is, uh, do wood chips in the bed absorb the nitrogen and what is it that they have been breaking down for two plus years? So I don't put wood chips in my bed. The wood chips go in the walkways. And there is a concern when you have your wood chips in the soil because the wood chips can tie up nitrogen. And so that's a concern that, that most of us have. So for me, I don't have that problem. And I actually don't mulch my beds with wood chips either because they're just gonna get mixed into the soil and I'm constantly turning over my bed. So I don't have that problem. It's okay to mulch the surface with wood chips if you're growing crops where it makes sense, right? If you're doing things where you're turning over the beds often, don't mulch with wood chips because you're never gonna get them out of the bed again. But if you're doing like perennial crops or really long-term stuff or some other things, you know, wood chips are awesome. And if they're on the surface, they're okay. They're not gonna tie up nitrogen. But once you incorporate them in the soil, that's when you have the problem. But again, not a problem in the walkways. If you could only grow one type of vegetable, what would you grow and why? Definitely lettuce. Uh, lettuce is my favorite crop for a few reasons. The main, the thing is when I first started farming here and I grew lettuce, my, I just, my mind was blown. I never had lettuce that tasted like that. Like it had flavor to it versus like the stuff you, I'm used to eat, I was used to eating. And I just got totally hooked on it. Also, the yields are awesome and it's very profitable. And it's also a crop that a lot of people eat all the time so it's a fairly easy crop to sell so for me lettuce for sure all right moving on what did you get discouraged or frustrated with with farming and gardening i think this changes year to year so this is now my fourth season so in the first couple seasons it was uh crop loss bad germination um beds getting washed out all those kinds of sort of things that are just growing problems, like having trouble growing things. I've sorted out most of that stuff now. I'm getting much more confident and I've decided on crops that work really well in my system. I've also worked really hard about creating living soil and having tunnels and good drainage and stuff like that. So now those aren't as much of an issue. So now the struggles really come with that balance of production and sales. So you wanna make sure that you're selling everything that you're growing. And when you have extra stuff, that can be frustrating. So trying to find the number of sales and then, you know, inconsistencies with, with people purchasing them and stuff like that and try not to be wasteful. So that's kind of my thing that I'm always trying to get into balance right now. 
Have you considered visiting home gardeners and providing advice and recommendations? This doesn't come up very often, and uh, some people do reach out to me for advice on starting farms and things like that, and I do offer consulting. It's something I really do that much of, and uh, I, I don't know. If people wanted me to and I could make it happen, I'd be okay with that. Uh, you got to remember that I was really not a home gardener ever, and I know this is a very small farm here, and maybe some of you guys call it a home garden because it's so small, but uh, I was never a gardener before I started farming. so. I, I can do, I know how to grow what I know how to grow in this kind of system, um, but uh, I, I, love, I love seeing what other people are up to. So if I could be helpful for someone, then um, absolutely. Next question is, uh, what other ingredients would you add to your lettuce greens uh, to make the ideal salad? So this is two questions. One is like to sell or to eat? <laughs> I guess those are different questions. When it comes to eating, I'll just throw in every green that I possibly have when I make a salad. Like, you know, any baby greens or anything, you know, is, is awesome, spinach, kale, you know, that kind of stuff you just throw it in. Now for a mix, uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach this. One way is you can grow a lot of different baby greens and then just mix in whatever you have and sort of change up your mix every week, which is great if, you, if your customers know that and it gives a little bit of diversity to your product and seasonality to it. And the other thing is if you're short on lettuce one week, you can bulk it up with some other stuff like I was talking about with the all-star mix. But for me now, I just grow, like, the, I was growing that Mir Cherokee Magenta mix as my main lettuce mix, and now I'm growing that the foundation mix from, the Salanova foundation mix. And I just mix all the seeds together. If they don't come together, I just buy the different seeds and put them together. And then <clears throat> just do the starts just randomly with, it, with the seeds in there, and then they go out in the field randomly, and then when I go to harvest it, uh, it's just all mixed up, and I really like that mix. So for me, that's been working great. The chefs like it, and... Uh, you know, so far so good. That's just kind of what I like. Keep it really simple. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind for that is the fact that if you are making your own mixes, um, you want to make sure that the days to maturity are going to be similar. So I did a kale mix for a while, a baby kale mix that was Red Russian kale, KX1, which is like a purple kale that looks just like Red Russian, and then Amaro, which is an Ethiopian kale. And um, it's actually a mustard, but it's called Ethiopian kale. And it was awesome. Problem though is once I pushed past like May into the summer, the Amaro grew so much faster that the mix didn't work. So you gotta make sure your timing works out for all the different crops in there so that you can um, you know, get a really nice mix and so things are coming to maturity at the same time. How much of your diet comes from your market garden? Uh, not very much because I grow a very limited crop selection. So I eat salad almost every day. Uh, otherwise, like, you know, we have carrots and we'll have cucumbers and some other stuff, but I don't grow a big, you know, variety of crops. And so I'm not, you know, in that homestead mindset where I'm growing for my family. I'm growing for, to sell. I'm growing a, a, a small amount of crops to sell. And because I'm only doing a small amount, I can plant successions of them and offer them on a regular basis to my customers and keeping them happy. So yeah, uh, we eat what we can, but it's not a full diet here whatsoever. Next question, do you direct seed your lettuce or just transplants for succession harvesting? I talked about that a little bit earlier um, and all the reasons for wanting to do transplants. So for me with lettuce, it's all transplants. Is straw the best mulch for veggies? So mulching is an interesting question and it varies a lot depending on where you are, what you have access to and what you're growing and sort of what your goals are. Now I don't add any mulch to the surface of my beds for a few reasons. The first thing is I don't need it because with the deep compost mulch system, the compost acts as a mulch. So I'll leave a link down below for a video explaining all that stuff if you wanna hear all the details and how that works. But if you do wanna mulch for some reason, uh, let's say you're trying to keep the soil cooler, maybe some weed suppression, um, those kinds of things, straw works great. The one thing you wanna think about is that you don't wanna uh, bring in more seeds to germinate and become weeds. So hay can be a problem if there are grass seeds in there. Uh, leaves are awesome. Leaves are a great thing to mulch with as well. As I said before, wood chips, probably not so much unless you're just always gonna leave it covered with wood chips. But if you're doing annual vegetables, you know, things like that that'll last a little while and that will break down uh, are probably a good idea. But uh, again, it's what you can get your hands on and sort of what makes sense. But again, I don't use any mulch on the surface because of, I just have compost and plants. Good day, Josh, question from Australia. Do you have to deal with pest damage? If so, how? So I get this question a lot about pest control and I don't use any insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, even if they're organic, I just don't use any of that stuff. So I don't, you know, I don't 
react to a problem, you gotta think about why that's being caused in the first place. And I did a video about pests, I'll leave that down below. And basically the answer is I don't deal with it. I focus on a couple things. First of all is healthy living soil. And when you're talking about creating living soil, there's four things you wanna think of. You wanna keep the ground covered, you wanna keep the ground planted, you wanna disturb it as little as possible, and you wanna have as much diversity as possible. And when you go through those steps, you create living soil that's healthy and the plants grow really well and can fight off a lot on their own. Now, is that 100%? Definitely not. This is not a perfect system. This is nature, right? And agriculture, we're putting that into something that's natural. And, you know, having 100 feet of lettuce is not like, you know, a natural thing. So it's not a perfect system. The other thing I do is that I don't plant certain crops at certain times. So I like to work with nature, not against nature. So if something is constantly being attacked by pests, for example, squirrels <laughs> with the tomatoes, I won't plant the tomatoes or I'll have to figure out a different way to do it. I didn't plant brassicas from May through October because I have crazy flea beetle pressure. So I generally don't grow brassicas in the summer because it's just not worth it for me. I'm gonna be experimenting with some insect netting this year and I'll let you guys know how that goes. But generally, I just plant the right thing at the right time and, and focus on healthy soil and find the crops that work in your system. Like if you're constantly battling against something, try something else. Uh, you could probably figure out something else to grow and something else to sell. Dispel this dispel the sentimentality sentimentality around a return to nature of the farm. Why be a farmer? That is a great question. I think it's different for everybody, and I think a lot of it came down to just feeling the urge, the need, the 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 draw to farming. Uh, for me, it's something that is very tangible. Uh, after teaching for five years, you know, I really enjoy doing things with my hands, having a product to show for, which is what led me into brewing beer professionally and then, um, you know, growing food. So I think there's also a big desire right now, especially with COVID for a couple reasons. Uh, that I hear a lot of people talking about this. One is people got nervous about uh, supply chain. They didn't know where their food was coming from. They wanted really healthy food. A lot of people were stuck at home with more time. Uh, a lot of people just really wanted to connect again with the soil and feel grounded and feel part of nature. And I think it's different for everybody. And I think that, uh, you know, there's a big movement of people that are interested in right now, which is fantastic. So it's a little bit different for everybody. And I also want to say that it doesn't mean that you need to get into commercial farming. I think there's a lot of people that watch, you know, like watch this channel, watch other guys and they're like, you know, homesteading, farmsteading and then going, going professional. And that isn't for, you don't have to do that. You can just grow food for your family and have fun with it and enjoy the, the high quality food. So um, I think in the world of digital stuff, the digital age we live in, I think people just want to be connected to, uh, to the earth and uh, it just kind of makes sense. Would you ever try growing crops in an aquaponic system? If so, why? And if no, why? So I do get asked this uh, pretty regularly and I have nothing against aquaponics and hydroponics. Just personally, I'm not interested in those kinds of systems for the way I'm gonna grow food. I live in a, it's very contextual. And so for me, I have soil, I have space. I'm gonna grow in the soil because I have it. Now there's a lot of places where you know, maybe you can't grow in the soil or maybe it's really, you know, a very dense, densely populated area and, you know, maybe they don't have access to, to stuff like that. And some of those systems are really high production for sure. Uh, so for here, I just use the natural things, soil, sunlight, water, and then, you know, stuff like that. But I think in, also in a lot of situations, aquaponics is super interesting because you can, in those systems, grow vegetables and also produce protein through the fish. And so that's a really cool system. Uh, just to me, it's just, it's, it's just something that I'm, I'm not personally interested in. Anyways, this is uh, getting on kind of long. I think I'll break this up into a second video. So I'll come back with another video soon and answer more of your questions. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching and uh, we'll see you in the next one.